Well, my guest today has played a variety of roles in movies and on television, including, of course, the iconic Captain Steve Burton from the legendary series Land of the Giants. But he's also played a variety of fascinating roles in real life. We're going to talk about all that and find out what he's up to today. Very honored to be here with Gary Conway. Gary, thank, thank you, you for much. being here. It's great yes. to be here. Now, I want to go in roughly a chronological order, just to keep it straight in my mind. And let's start with your early development as an artist. Am I correct in stating that you, at the age of 14, were granted three full scholarships to the most prestigious art schools yeah. in the country? I started paint and draw when I was four. Okay. And to this day, at my studio at my vineyard and ranch, I have only 6,000 paintings and drawings. Really? And I was a precocious little kid. And uh, my parents were teachers and even early showing this particular gift uh, instead of having their garage in LA I'd have a studio and, it, and yes at a very young age uh, well, what does someone do by the age of 14 to earn an art scholarship well, it was that I, I painted so much and it was recognized uh, that I had this gift and then a couple of teachers submitted this for instance uh, in the LA the, the biggest showing they have yeah. there yeah. I got second prize which is amazing anyway so I ended up getting, uh, there was four scholarships, one was out of L.A., but the ones in L.A. were the famous Chenard, Otis, and, uh, art, uh, and, and Art Center. You must have been a very serious young man. Well, it was sort of serious, but uh, the kids around me, uh, they knew a lot of the classes I had were live models, oh, nude okay. models, women, and all, all my friends <laughs> Can we go to school with you? And I had explained to us, that's the same thing. Right. You're looking at a naked woman as when you're having to draw and paint. It's a kind of a different mindset. But you were you were uh, on the fast track to becoming a very serious artist. That's right. And still are. Uh, but in 1957, was it, you were cast as the lead in I Was a Teenage Frankenstein? Right. Okay. How did that all that come about? A lovely movie. A very... Yeah, movie. yeah. <laughs> and I was at UCLA at the time. And I was... Uh, in relatively good shape and I had done one play there something one thing led to another and I got cast in it and at that point uh, <laughs> I was a, a, a bouncer at the roller game. no not even at a bar <laughs> and this was a lot Teenage Frankenstein was more prestigious yeah, yeah, getting go. girls than being a bouncer <laughs> right right game. right okay so I, I took the role got the first idea of what acting and films, what that all meant. At that point, as an artist, mm -hmm. I was dedicated to be a painter. The only problem I had, when I was 14 and 15, my favorite artists were Van Gogh and Gauguin. Okay. And I got very depressed because no one ever liked their paintings. All right, and, while they were alive. They didn't even like, yes, yeah. like them. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, well, wait a minute. If somebody liked my paintings, that must mean I'm not going to be <laughs> not very good. good. So what am I doing in my life? I'm going to be a painter, but if I'm going to be good, I'm just going to be starving, people are going to hate me. And then uh, a couple of years later, with this film, and then I got an offer for a contract at Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. That was a big deal then, because they were doing all the series. And so it took me a little bit of time. Really? Oh, man. But I never stopped painting. Right, 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 right. You can always be an artist. And then your first foray into series television was with Burke's Law, which ran from 63 to 66. Right. Now, this was at a time when there weren't a million networks. We had three channels. That's right. So when you were on television, you were on television. That's one thing people don't realize today. Yes, when you were on TV, uh, and even Atlanta Giants, for, that was on a Sunday, it was a big show. Uh, I think Burke Law, Burke's Law was on a Friday. The following day, you walked the street, everybody... Knew you. Saw you last night. Yeah. yeah. Today, if you do a, you can do a big show, and no one knows. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so Burke's Law was Aaron Spelling's first show. Okay. And it was a four-star, which was a very prestigious uh, studio at mm -hmm. that point. And uh, and the and the whole idea behind it was that they had the literal, literally hundreds of renowned, great, great movie stars. So, as still youngish. And not, you know, not that sophisticated. Every day, I would meet four or five or six of the greatest stars. I mean, one day, for instance, as an example, uh, and I would go in and I never took advantage of this, but I, as I said, one day I was sitting next to this older guy. I thought it was an older guy at that time. We were just chatting and, and, and talking and cutting and fooling a little bit. 
Uh, and then about 45 minutes an hour into this conversation, the assistant manager, the production manager came in and said, Mr. Rathbone. Oh, no. Uh, we're ready for you. Now, Sherlock Holmes, one of my favorite show yeah, when yeah. I was a kid. And I was there with Mr. Rathbone oh. and didn't have a clue. But oh. Burke's Law was Aaron Spelling's first show. That's good. Cool. Okay, so off of uh, Burke's Law, was it 1967 when you interviewed for Land of the Giants? Yeah, that came up. I could have also, by the way, done Star Trek. I didn't know that at the time. Because Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry, the producer, brought me in one day. And it was for a series called Lieutenant. Okay. And then he began talking to me. And he was indicating he was doing this kind of sci-fi thing. It didn't overwhelm me that oh, Really? Yeah. So now, did you interview with Irwin Allen for the part? No. Irwin Allen cast me without interview. Wow. Let me explain for a second who Irwin Allen is yeah, to the uninitiated. In, uh, in the 70s, Irwin Allen became known as the master of disaster for films like The Towering Inferno and The Poseidon Adventure. But in the 1960s, Irwin Allen sort of brought the big screen to the small screen with a new wave of science fiction with shows like Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, uh, Time Tunnel, Lost in Space, and of course, Land of the yeah, Giants. Yeah, it, it was. He, he brought a uh, whole filmmaking experience. Before that, there was a lot of series of just talk, talking to each other, especially mm -hmm. comedies, the other series, you'd be staying in one room. He right. brought this adventure. This it's like movies. You're right, and he brought a new techniques to it that okay. later on, you know, were, that's why Star Wars was able to go, he brought uh, all kinds of inventive things he brought to mm -hmm. Land of the Giants. And, uh, when you go back and think that Land of the Giants, there was, we were doing everything ourselves. There was no, uh, there was no help from, you know, any, any internet stuff or any, right. uh, any anything. We, okay. were, we just had to do it. And, right. and he had the, uh, the foresight to see how it all worked visually. Mm -hmm. And later on, Land of the Giants became, most people don't realize it, the number one series in the world. A lot of it had to do with its visual quality. Well, it was the most expensive series ever oh, produced absolutely. at the time. Yeah, so yeah. that uh, that was cool. And it, and, and I was going to say, I'm okay. say, so special effects, right? Which we know today understand in a certain way. Basically, that show almost invented it, but we didn't have the advantage, right, of special effects. CGI, yeah, yeah, so. Right now. Yeah, so, and uh, to the outsider, it looks like a lot of fun. You're running around, hiding, you got a spaceship, you're running from giants and stuff, but it was pretty physically demanding. I mean, Absolutely. that climbing a rope is fun the first time, but if you got to do take two and take three, you did. that's... Yeah, normally, because you go up the 40, 50 feet climbing like this on your own, yeah. and I had our co-stars, two great guys, you know, yeah. and we were all, you know, competitive because they were good athletes. But I was the captain, so I always had to be sure I was in front. Right. That was not always doable. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I could, I could see Don Marshall maybe a little too close. And I couldn't tell Don. And Don, you know, a little bit, so I had to go a little harder. Okay. And when he got up there, the director said, great. And then the cameraman said, I didn't quite get it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> they didn't care. <laughs> Climb the rope again. Yeah, the, the whole... The, concept of uh, uh, having a double didn't, I don't think hurt him. Right. Plus they're always on your damn face, so you can't, right, right, right. you know, it's, a double's not going to work. Right. Well, and you also, in one episode, uh, got your ribs broken. Yes, in a fight. Yeah. Within a cage. Okay. And the guy who was, it was a um, method actor. Okay, yeah, yeah. And we, and we worked it all out. It was, Mm -hmm. He couldn't go back too far, and sure enough, he nailed me, got a rib, pretty damn near broken, and then uh, they had a call off the, the day, and then about two weeks later, they brought him back to, uh, we had to redo the scene. I said, you know, you got to fake it and build a plane, of course, but I'm sorry, I was a little carried away. We got through this nice discussion about how to do a fight, a stage fight, we got in to it. Started in. I could see him, something taking over. He got into it again, and boom! Oh, no. <laughs> he got my other side. <laughs> 
that's We never great. finished this. Really? <laughs> you were beat up. did not want to do it a third time. So was it fun? Was it, was it a pleasant experience uh, the, the it was, overall? It was, it was so many experiences. Yeah. yeah. The one thing I brag about today, and I'll have to mention the cast, we, we loved each other, got along terrifically. When I hear about other casts, arguments that we never did, always supporting each other, mm -hmm. uh, always took it seriously. One mm -hmm. of the reasons I feel I've heard all day today people who are now watching it again seriously with their kids get a lot out of it, a lot out of it, and they really like it and they're constantly comparing it to the shows today where they're not mm -hmm. getting much out of it. So we really took our work seriously because we felt, although we, you could look at it two ways, you could think, well, we're just doing a kind of a comic show, who cares? But we were doing it as if we were doing Shakespeare. You know, different words. Right, right, right. But to be believable, mm -hmm. to have energy, to have intention, is something you still have to have. So we all rallied on that, because you could lose it very quickly. You know, mm -hmm. by hour 10, and they're giving you the new lines, and the lines are, watch out, go right. look at the giant. <laughs> you could look at them as, the, and it's kind of silly. No, we never took it silly. Good. Ever. Yeah. And I think that's why it plays today. And I think I must have heard, I don't know how many, one after that still gets something out of it. Right, and one right. person came to me and said, we love the show, we're yeah. seeing it now. And uh, my little boy likes it, he said he's five years old. Little boy. Of course that's good because yeah, they, yeah. they see the big and little people. And then uh, the guy said, I'm going to be seeing Gary Conway today. So he said, he plays Steve Burton, so this little five-year-old today said, oh yeah, he's cool. Hey, that's it, right? That is too cool. That's great. All these years later, I'm still cool. You, say, oh, you can't well, do better than that. Much of your life and livelihood has revolved around a certain piece of property that you own, right. and there's a really interesting story about you happen to, how you happen to find yeah. that piece yeah, of land. Yeah. Can you tell us that story? Well, it's it, in a connective piece, you know, we have Land of the Giants, and there is this land, and I... When I was doing Burke's Law, is what happened. Uh, I'm living in LA and there's smog, and smog was a big deal then, believe right. me. And my wife and I wanted a place to get away, to breathe out of the city. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine on Burke's Law, who's an actor in Burke's Law, said, You have to go to this city, a town called Paso Robles, uh, uh, north of, of Santa Barbara. Okay. What was that? It's like a cow town at that point. Cowboy time. And anyway, so we decided to uh, 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 just take a trip spontaneously, bought some friends, and went up and stayed at this ranch, fell in love with this you know, real land of the Giants. And um, so later on, I contacted my friend who advised doing that. He put me in touch with the real estate guy up there. I shot up again. It's about, it about a four or five hour drive. And when I went to see the real estate agent, I explained what I'm looking for this, you know, place out of town. I just want to have color and beauty. And as an artist, as a painter, mm -hmm. I'd fallen in love with this region because of its pure color also. And anyway, I, I said, he told me I have the perfect place for you. It just came on the market. Later on, I learned it was a homesteaded place. And so the people who are going to buy it from you know, it homesteaded 140 years before. Okay. So just coming on the market was not a concept okay. uh, that you would be over familiar with in that sense. So anyway, we jumped, which I thought was going to be in his, his Cadillac, instead in a helicopter. We took off, went over a couple of ranges, and as we went over the last one, this property is a valley, incredible valley. And in the Santa Lucia Mountains, six miles from Cambria, the most beautiful place almost on Earth. And as we were coming over, the helicopter hit something, learned later it was high tension wires, it was like an explosion, and we started hurtling down. And it was a long way, the, the helicopter was trying to guide it so we wouldn't immediately crash land. But I knew we were doomed, Yeah. and on the way down I was still looking at this glorious, glorious vista. And I said to myself, if I live, I'm going to buy this place. <laughs> and I lived. Okay. Walked out, the helicopter totally crashed, and uh, 
the old homesteader was 95, was running up the hill. And I said, don't worry, we'll, we'll clean it up, I'm buying a place. And I bought it. <laughs> and, and so that, I have that to this day. Oh, that's and great. And uh, it's a winery and vineyard called Carmody McKnight, okay. which is my real name. Original name, Carmody, yeah. yeah. Carmody. And McKnight is my wife's, who is Miss America, Marion yeah. McKnight, great, great Miss, Mac, uh, Miss America. So we, we decided to use our birth names like signing a painting, okay. a name that is the closest to you. Neat. So uh, we've had it to this day, and that's been uh, an incredible experience on the other side. And what's, I think I mentioned this to you before, what's wonderful is, is that it's, I now use all of the metaphors and similes of Land of the Giants, because as we're making our wine, I'm realizing I'm in the the land of the corporate giants. How about it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so. And they're evil. They're, you gotta watch them. They're not. They're not up for you. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in this, and what's terrific, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to be with you, because in this pop culture world, world that we're dealing with, uh, and and I think the, the the greatness of the concept of the land of the giants, you know, that goes back to Jonathan Swift. Mm -hmm. And is the fact that it's about the little person against the big person. Mm -hmm. and that's why, as I mentioned earlier, it became so popular around the world. And we are always still the little people. I mean, yeah. not basically, we cannot be that unless you want to take a job as the head of a you know, huge corporation. Right, right, right. And make phony wine, then you, right. then you get to. We're small and getting smaller all the uh, yeah, time. Yeah, right. But ha have I got the, the word right? You're a viticulturist, is that? Uh, there's two things. There's a vintner, vintner? Vitical viticulturist is what I am also. Okay. Uh, planting the grapevine. Okay. And uh, knowing all about it. And that planted 37 years ago, so I was the first one to plant in that area. Okay. That way. Should know something about it. Vintner is basically that person who then takes the grapes and makes the wine. Okay. It's also can be called a knowledgeist, a person knowing that. And uh, and we have from day one never fertilized in 37 years, unheard of in all of the history of agriculture, because we're on three volcanoes. Okay, so makes, so your soil is uh, conducive to growing this? Well, it's the, it, when I say that we've never fertilized in 37 years, you can go anywhere you want in this world and you'll never find that, anybody saying that. Okay. We also have soils that are so powerful that uh, one called calcium or melanine, which is Chinese root there. Uh, and we have a, an aspect of that soil that, uh, that doesn't exist anywhere else. So it's a powerful, powerful soil. And, and, and the problem is that most wines produced are not that way, correct? That, and tell me about the, the toxins and the GMOs. Well, in, that... in the last 30 years, like in our diet, all of us, in the United States, we are all taking 3,000 chemicals, all of them bad. Wine is the worst of all in that, the average wine. And they've succumbed to this factory making of wine. What is, is it preservatives, whatever it is? It, it, it's because the, all the vines now are genetically modified. Okay. And anything, you know, people, most people, if you, if you go into Whole Foods, they say, no more GMO. Right. It's not that GMO is going to poison you, but when you have a GMO plant, it does not uptake minerals. Okay. And what it does, it means that it has no flavor. Okay. Just try a backyard tomato, a really beautiful tomato or a blueberry out in the woods. Mm -hmm. and you go buy one in your market. Okay. So the markets are getting better. I think right. they're understanding this. They're keeping more chemicals out of food. Okay. But it's better we have none. Right, right. In fact, the United States has become the most unhealthy country on earth. Right. So if you're, but these giants have said, Hey, we can feed you with all this stuff. That way you don't have to grow anything or think much. You just go to wherever you go market and buy all this packaged stuff and you'll be fine. The problem is, is we become the most unhealthy country on earth. Okay. Overnight. Yeah, and it's about maximizing profit, correct? Well, I mean, well absolutely. Yeah. And, and, it's, and, and we go along with it. Now, the Italians don't go along with it. Okay. They were just, by the Bloomberg poll, they're the number one healthiest country in the world right now. And they had big headline. Why? That's another thing. We first, olive oil. So olive oil and wine, through history, olive oil and wine are the two mandatory foods that we all, all must take. But real olive oil, right? Real olive oil, which is very different, which you cannot find in the market today. Okay. 
and you know symbolically if you look through history why was it remember we had this thing called the last supper everybody remember that mm -hmm. i saw a painting once yeah yeah uh, <laughs> yeah it was a great painting and these uh these guys went called jesus right oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and they said probably they were going to put together a great wine dinner or something and they said oh the hell with it we'll just have wine because wine then represented all you ever have to put in your body. Okay. And if you were an Italian growing up, and, and you were in the Roman army, Caesar, the only, but they, they said that every Roman soldier had to have a liter and a half of wine. When Jefferson went to f France, you, he had to have wine. Because wine was life and death. Mm -hmm. Because see, wine, you made wine from the grapes, and we know about resveratrol, we know about grapeseed extract, and the alcohol preserves it. So your other foods are not preserved anywhere in the days before electricity right. and before freeze. But, but wine lives. But that wine was a different product than yes, what's... Yes, because wine should be made from one thing, the grape. Okay. And, and, and one of the miracles of nature, you put a grape and you put it away somewhere, it ferments. No other fruit does that. And then you drink that. And I, that was my first memory at four years old, to drink real wine. If you don't have real wine, it becomes fake wine. Okay. okay. Which is what we have to do. So, what can the little people do to fight the corporate giants? Well, the little people, uh, as we were on uh, that planet, number one, have to be aware that the giants are not necessarily looking after us. Right, right, right. And so Steve Burton was constantly reminded, don't, you know, we're little people. Those guys, uh, there's something, something else going on. Mm -hmm. So. And one of, the, one of the most important lessons anyone can learn in life is educate yourself. Educate yeah. yourself. And uh, to know where our food comes from and know not only where it comes from, from what foods provide health, and most importantly, uh, what anti-inflammatory. That's another thing we don't understand anymore, that all disease is inflammation. And we should be eating foods that are most anti-inflammatory, which is real wine, and real olive oil. Okay, real wine, real olive oil. And, and that's why you'll see, if you go back in the tradition, you go to Italy today, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as in my house. You have wine, my, as I said, my With first breakfast? Before, absolute, that's the, they consider the most important part. Okay. And, and you have wine and olive oil, constantly. Okay. And that's why my family, Sicilian family, are being studied to this day because they're so darn healthy. That's great. They never had arthritis. Arthritis was unknown. Cancer was unknown. Heart disease was unknown. So the, the most important thing is not worried about ISIS in the Middle East. Is worried about uh, your family, your friends, yourself, eating correctly. So we don't, by age 50, which is true in this country, we're taking four or five pharmaceuticals. Right. And by the way, we're taking now, over the last 20, 30 years, all of you, everyone here, on average, three thousand chemicals in our body that never, never, never around. In wine, they're up to three hundred chemicals in a bottle of wine, and they don't have to, by law, even state it. And those chemicals are boosted by alcohol. Yeah, it's it's terrifying. Yeah, yeah. But it can all change because nobody. We can demand real food and real wine. Yeah. It's up to us. I I urge everyone just educate yourself. It's not that difficult. And it's all there. The great thing about now that we have to combat these things, we have something called the internet that ends up having all this information mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. Look up real olive oil, authentic olive oil. Mm -hmm. Look up our website too. I, I don't want to promote anything, but we have all that information. And your website is? It's uh, Carmody, my real name, McKnight.com. All this information is there. Mm -hmm. All this inf information doesn't come from me. It comes from scientists right, and right. the university. And authorities. I don't believe in telling anybody about anything unless I can show a test right. result. And this is not profit oriented for you as opposed to the corporate giants who have a vested interest in keeping people ignorant. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying I don't want to, you know, there are some corporations doing the best they can. It's just that, and, and again, it's land of the giants. There were some giants. There were some good ones. ones. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just the ones that uh, I believe that think money is the most important. Right, right, yeah. And uh, but there, 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 you know, a lot of thank God corporations that will put our welfare 
ahead, and we should support those too, by the there way. There you go. There you go. Well, Gary, I'm not going to take any more of your time. Thank you so much for being with us today. You've got a you fascinating... You told me this was going to be a five-hour interview. Yeah, right? yeah, well... I brought my lunch. We're, we're, we're breaking for halftime right now, and the other crew is coming in. <laughs> the other crew.